Welcome to the Ideas on Stage podcast, your regular insight into leadership communication. Hey, John, welcome to the show. Andrea, great to be here. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Today, we are going to talk about a couple of topics, the main one being analogies, the power of analogy, particularly when it comes to communication. For me, this is a fascinating topic. You wrote an excellent, super interesting book, Shortcut, which is all about the power of analogy. So we are going to talk about that. And then also time permitting, because you worked as a, you are a former presidential speech writer for Bill Clinton. So I would love to ask you some questions about speech writing as well but i would like to start with just a curiosity john because i know i watched your tedx talk and in that talk also i think in your book maybe you talk about this boat that you've built a a cork boat so what what is that what what have you done well uh actually uh, when i was uh six years old i uh, i built a, a raft out of old crates and I summoned all the neighbors to a launch uh, at, at, the, at the pond down the block. And, and, and I was really excited and I stepped aboard and, and it went glug, glug, glug straight to the bottom. And the pond was not so deep and I, I was fine. But rather than getting discouraged, I decided I was, I was going to build another boat guaranteed to float. And I decided that at the age of seven or so that I was going to build it out of wine corks, because if you couldn't sink a cork, how could you sink a cork boat? And so I asked my parents to start saving their their corks. And uh, it took me about 30 years of saving. Uh, and I, uh, it was always, it became a running joke in our family, you know, another cork for the boat. Uh, and then I revived the project uh, with a friend and got bars and restaurants saving uh, their corks and then a cork company to sponsor. And we ended up building a 22 foot Viking ship uh, made out of 165,321 corks. And, and we ended up shipping it to Portugal, trucking it up the, uh, to the Spanish uh, border and coming down the Douro River uh, to uh, Oporto. And it was just a great trip, really hard as it turns out. We thought it would be an easy float through wine country. As it turns out, we faced headwinds the entire way. Uh, and with the dams on the river, uh, we really had to row, uh, and we thought it would be five days. It took us 17, but it was a glorious trip. And that was uh, uh, 19 years ago. That's, that's commitment. And, and also, I would love for you, John, to share a, a story that you share in your TEDx talk, because uh, you've worked as a speechwriter uh, for, for Bill Clinton, and when you arrived there at the White House for the interview, then I don't want to spoil it, but it's interesting. You, you basically now connecting this to the topic of our conversation, which is analogies. You managed to, to use an interesting analogy to connect what you've done with that boat and, and that job, speech writing. But I don't want to share more. Would you like to share it with the listeners? Yeah. So I, I, at the time I was, I got called to interview at the White House. I was uh, unemployed. Uh, and I had I had left a previous job to to work on some of my, some of my own projects, and I had uh, tried to get into the White House several times and as a speechwriter and and had not succeeded. I, I had worked on Capitol Hill. I, I had experience, but but those jobs are tough to get. And but one day the phone rings, and and the next morning I found myself you know sitting in the West Wing uh, on a couch. Uh, interviewing for a job as a speechwriter to the president. And the uh, chief speechwriter, uh, who I actually just talked with uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, because I've stayed friends with him, but at the time he was very intimidating. And, and he was sitting behind this big desk reading my, my CV. And, and he said, I, can, I, I know you can write, I've seen you writing and I, it's clear you have experience, but what's this about you building the world's first cork boat. And, and I, at that time, was still collecting corks for it. And I had it on the last line under the other category. And I, 
I said, well, I, I've been saving cork since the age of seven. I'm going to, when I collect enough wine corks, we're going to make a Viking ship and take it on an epic voyage through French wine country. Because that was the plan at the time, was, was France. And, and I could see him grow skeptical, like who was this whack job that, that I'm thinking about hiring? I, I think I've made the wrong decision even bringing him in for the interview. And I could see in this silence, uh, my entire last best opportunity to become a presidential speechwriter slipping away. And I, and, and I started to panic. And then all of a sudden this analogy out of nowhere popped into my mind and I said, sir, uh, building a cork boat is a, is a lot like writing a good speech. Uh, and, and, and he kind of pushed his glasses up to the top of his head. And I said, well, because in both cases, you take a jumble of small things, either words or corks that don't do much on their own, but if you put them into just the right order, they'll take you on an amazing journey. And he slowly started to smile. And I, I don't think he was so impressed with the analogy perhaps, but, but my, my escape. Yeah. Uh, and, he, and you got he, the job. Yeah, he got the analogy and I got the job. He got the job. And that's, that's the power of, of analogy as well in communication. And, and John, let, let's start with the basics. Like for those who perhaps are not 100% clear in terms of what we're talking about here, how would, you how would you describe it? What's an analogy, really? Well, uh, I always say that analogies are like uh, guests coming to a Halloween party. They wear a lot of different costumes. And so you've got uh, similes and metaphors. Uh, you've got legal arguments, even some mathematical formulas, uh, parables, fables. Uh, all these are, are, are different types of analogies. But, but at its core, an analogy uh, uh, is a comparison that, that uh, asserts similarities uh, between two distinct things based on certain shared qualities. Uh, so that when I say, for example, a, a, a cork boat is a lot like a good speech, on the surface, it would seem those two have nothing uh, in common, but because they're both made up of small things put into a perfect order that will carry you on a journey, suddenly uh, they, have a share, they have some shared qualities. Uh, some shared qualities that, that help make an argument. And, and, and essentially that's what an, an analogy is ultimately. It's a spring-loaded argument uh, that, that asserts a comparison, uh, usually to the advantage of the person who's making the analogy, uh, if the analogy is well chosen. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's the idea of like connecting two things that even if apparently they've got nothing to do with each other, like a cork boat and speech writing. But then when you make that connection, that's when learning happens. And also you, you say, John, that when we, when we think about analogies, now the idea is that often we can only explain something new if we connect it to something that the audience already knows and understands, right? So that's, that's the idea. Right, and that's how we uh, learn everything because you, you, you can only, you need, the, you need to, it's like playing with Legos. You can only make something complex out of simpler pieces that you snap together in new combinations. Uh, but to do that, you have to, you have to play and, and you have to uh, experiment. And, and, and this is the whole process of, of human, uh, evolution in a sense, if, if our ancestors had not been good at uh, uh, seeing a floating log and thinking, ah, it could be a crocodile, uh, they would get eaten. Uh, and, and, and that analogical instinct, as I call it, to, to make comparisons, to seek shared qualities uh, is really core to the, our, the way we perceive the world and we operate, it, operate within it. Because if you are in a new city, for the first time and you come to a, a, a red light, you've never seen that red light before, but you stop because you know that red lights mean stop. And that's uh, at a very basic level, our analogical instinct at work. And if, if it were not for this uh, ability, we would not be able to function because every situation is by definition a new situation, but what is it like that we have experienced before? 
Yeah. And their analogical instinct, John, that you mentioned, this is something that it's a bit like a muscle, right? We can, we can get better at it. We can train that muscle. Do you have any, any tips for those who want to, maybe not professional speech writers like you, but say that somebody wants to, they give, they speak in public, they give presentations, they want to get better at using analogies in their communication? I know that it's a broad question, yeah, but no, what, I, what, It is a muscle and, and, and if you exercise it, it gets stronger. And I would say that the most important uh, thing is to uh, become uh, a critical listener. Because we, the first thing is we have to pay attention to the analogies uh, around us. Uh, even, even, the, even the phrase pay attention, it suggests that you, you have a limited quantity of attention and you, and you have to pay for things, uh, uh, just like you have a limited quantity of money and you pay for things and you have to make choices. What do you buy? What do you buy with your, your time and attention? Uh, and so listening and, and just saying, I hear an analogy. Oh, that's an analogy. Um, uh, things such as, uh, as a kid, you learn, don't, don't cry wolf, uh, or that's just sour grapes. And these are old fables, of course, that uh, reduce complex concepts down to two or three words uh, through the process of analogy. Uh, and the key is that, that if you start listening and, and just make a mental note every time you hear an analogy in the course of your day, you're probably going to hear uh, dozens, if not a hundred uh, analog analogies, um, unless you're yeah. sitting alone in a cave. Uh, and, yeah. and so once you start recognizing them, then you can say, well, what's the next step is to, if you encounter an analogy, what's, what's not true about this? Like what is not the same about a cork boat and a, and a, and a good speech? And you can make an argument that a lot of things are, are, are not the same. In fact, almost everything is not the same. Uh, except something very salient. And this returns to the point that I made a, a few minutes ago is that analogies are spring-loaded arguments. They're, they're designed to lead you to a certain conclusion. And I think that people get into trouble when they fall for the wrong analogies. And it doesn't mean that the person making the analogy is malintentioned, although they certainly might be. Uh, it could just be that they have a, a different perspective. So for example, the uh, domino theory of foreign relations, which led the United States into a, the quagmire of Vietnam, uh, in the, the argument was made at, 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 in the 1950s that if you didn't stop communism uh, in Vietnam, then it would, then it would be a, a domino effect and Laos would go and Cambodia would go and Thailand would go and, and pretty soon, the, the communists would be uh, you know, knocking on the door in Hawaii. Well, as, as we know, uh, that, that domino theory really held sway uh, for, for a long time at terrible cost. And did, in the end, the United States lost in Vietnam. And did the other countries topple like dominoes? No, they didn't because they're not dominoes. Uh, they have their own unique cultures, they have their own e economies and geographies and traditions. And so how we frame uh, arguments and how we evaluate those arguments and, and deconstruct the analogies is really, really important. So it's, 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 I would say, you don't even have to be a great maker of analogies. What you really need to be is a great uh, taker aparter of analogies to, to be inarticulate there, but, but how do we deconstruct them and say what's not true? And, and is what's not true more salient than what is true? Yeah, and you, you just gave an example of the, the persuasive power of, of analogies. And, and you also talk about it in the book. There's, of, of course, it's, it's more complex than that, but we can say just to simplify that, we've got all of us, we've got two parts in our brain. We've got the emotional side and the rational side. And there is something, there is a connection between 
analogies and how they trigger the emotional parts of people's brain, which is very important, for example, when it comes to making decisions or believing certain things. What, what's your take on these, uh, John? Uh, the, yeah. We are emotional creatures, uh, despite our best uh, uh, intentions and, and self-illusions. Uh, and uh, emo good analogies uh, ring true in part because they, they trigger emotional associations. Uh, and again, sometimes these analogies can be wrong. Uh, and I'll give you a good example. The United States right now has this huge prison population and a whole awakening around uh, Black Lives Matter and social justice and how, how the, the, the justice system is, is anything but just and, and tends to, to prey on uh, poor people and especially Black people. And one of the policy decisions that, that produced this uh, some decades ago was uh, a law in California that was then copied uh, in about half the states called Three Strikes and You're Out. And there had been a, a brutal murderer by a, a convicted felon uh, who was out on parole. And the father of the murder victim couldn't bring his daughter back, but he launched a ballot initiative to, uh, to impose mandatory prison sentences on, on repeat offenders. And it, he called it three strikes and you're out. And that's from baseball, uh, you get, you know, if you if you miss three times, you're out, and and that really caught on quickly in California because baseball is fair, and 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 there are rules, and you play by those rules, and there is strict accountability for errors in baseball, and and as a consequence, the ballot initiative passed, and and it filled up the prisons very quickly at huge cost to the public. But the only problem was that that it was some of those third offenses, those third strikes were shoplifting or forging a check or taking change from a cup holder in a car. And, and, and as a consequence, you had, you know, a huge, you know, a huge number of incarcerated, you know, people for, for relatively minor expense, offenses, some, some serious criminals, yes, uh, as well, uh, but a great cost to society uh, in, in many ways. Uh, the only problem is, is that, in, in the analogy is while emotionally resonant because everyone wants fairness, why would you base criminal justice policy uh, on the game of baseball? Even in the game of baseball, the third strike is qualitatively different than, than the first two. You, if you're, as long as you're getting a piece of the ball uh, and it doesn't get caught uh, by an opposing player, you get another try. A and so uh, we need to be wary of uh, um, emotionally resonant uh, analogies. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they're necessarily wrong, but that they be careful you're not getting suckered um, or swayed uh, because of the emotional content and the associations that, that it brings up. Yeah, and this leads me to another question, John, because we are talking about now good analogies, maybe either wrong analogies or I don't know whether we can say wrong, but like in terms of the accuracy, like if you want to use analogies to get your message across in any communication context and to do it effectively, does an analogy always have to be 100% accurate? What do you think? I would say two things. One is that no analogy is 100% accurate because again, you can always find something that uh, is not uh, the same about the two things you're comparing. That's the nature of an analogy is that, that you're, you're making an, uh, an association between two things that uh, may have aspects, a comparison that may have aspects that are tr truer than others. So I think that's important to keep in mind. There is no perfect analogy, uh, but there are better analogies and there are worse analogies. The second thing is that analogies, good analogies resonate with their audience. So you need to, uh, from a communicator standpoint, you, as we mentioned 
explaining something new in terms of something that people already understand. Uh, a baseball analogy is probably not a good one if you're making an argument in Uzbekistan. Uh, but I'm sure there are Uzbeki sports that, that might be uh, more relevant and um, um, uh, a deeper mine of potential. Um, so understanding your audience and where they're coming from, what they're interested in, uh, where their emotions are at uh, is important. That's the, that's the key thing. And, and absolutely. And it's important when it comes to analogies. I would say it's the most important thing in communication in general. We at Ideas on Stage, as you know, John, for us, it's all about presentation skills and public speaking. And we always tell our clients, when you give a presentation or a speech, it's not your presentation. It's their presentation. It's always the audience's presentation, which is very much connected to what you've just said. Also, in your book, John, you say one of the tips you give is that we should not fall in love with the first analogy. Say that we want to come up with an interesting and original analogy that helps us communicate a message more effectively. You say don't fall in love with the first thing that comes to mind. Why is that? Well, because uh, there is usually uh, more than one right answer. And, and, and each right answer, each different analogy that might shed light on a situation uh, can be helpful in, in illuminating different aspects of, of the problem or the solution that you're, you're trying to, to, to explain. And I, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the physicist, but there was a, there was a Einstein was writing a paper uh, about light uh, in terms of uh, uh, particles and, and this other physicist was writing about light in terms of uh, behaving as waves uh, and both were correct and both were uh, useful in explaining different aspects of the behavior of light. Uh, and so is one right? Uh, they're both right. Uh, are there aspects of each one that, that could be criticized? Certainly. Uh, but the important thing is to uh, try different ones because you might learn different things about it. And in the end, in terms of a presentation, you might decide that one is better than the other and, and go with that one. But at least you'll have a better understanding of the, the strengths and weaknesses of your argument um, in case someone challenges you or just to make sure that it is the most resonant and, and apt uh, yeah. analogy. Yeah, and, and that also allows you to look at the same thing, the same concept, idea, message, also from a fresh or different perspective, which is also another thing that you mentioned in your book. And I agree with it hundred percent. We also find it with our, in our line of work, you say that the closer you are to your context or situation or message idea, the harder it is to look at it from a fresh perspective, right? Yes. And, yeah. and in one great example, uh, if you look at the, the history of uh, innovation, uh, the, and there's several examples, let's take a communications example. Uh, Gutenberg, uh, uh, and, and inventing the movable type uh, in, the, in the first pr printing press, uh, he came at it uh, seeing potential because his his father had had worked as a in a mint making coins, uh, which are essentially uniform discs uh, with the same image uh, on it. Uh, and he also lived in a, a region of Germany that was had uh, grew grapes and had wine presses. And he had this epiphany that what if you, instead of pressing, uh, you know, moisture out of something that you pressed moisture into, into paper uh, and you did it in a pattern, he, he was able to combine these, these building blocks, these conceptual building blocks uh, from disparate fields to create a new uh, solution. And in fact, when a, a promoter of his, went to Paris with these Bibles, the many people there, you know, accused him of working with the devil because how could anybody produce so many 
identical books that previously had to be written, each one of them. Uh, but of course, it completely revolutionized commerce because information could be printed and conveyed uh, much more easily. And, and then, of course, uh, it led to much greater literacy and, and changed the course of, of history. So, but again, it was that uh, analogical uh, approach to see a, a challenge, how do you reproduce things uh, effectively and efficiently. Uh, it was analogy that allowed him to, to approach that from a fresh perspective. And let me give one other example. Sure. Because I love, I love the Wright brothers. Uh, the Wright brothers uh, were up against um, the head of the Smithsonian Institution who had $50,000, which was then a great sum of money, uh, from the War Department to build a flying machine. And, and the Wright brothers were bicycle makers in Dayton, Ohio. And they approached the challenge of controlled flight, um, not by watching birds uh, as people had for centuries and, and building flapping contraptions, but, but rather uh, looking uh, at uh, the control of uh, an unstable vehicle in three dimensions, which is essentially what a bicycle is. It, it, it banks, uh, you, you don't turn it just by turning the, the, you don't stay perfectly upright when you go around a corner, you, you, you bank into it. And, and, and so it, it requires a, an, a, an approach to balance uh, that, was gave them a competitive advantage as they designed wings that weren't perfectly rigid but twisted to allow for the control of the airflow uh, and and they had used tension spokes as were common on bicycles to to uh, help design the wings and 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 indeed the they were the first to to fly uh, as a as a result of their fresh analogical approach to the challenges of of controlled flight and this is why I found your book, which, by the way, I've got here also for our listeners. If you can see, for those who are watching on video, Shortcut, How Analogies Reveal Connections, Spark Innovation, and Sell Our Greatest Ideas. Now, of course, as a public speaking and presentation coach, I was really intrigued in, from that from the chapter, the part which connects analogies and communication. But it's more than that. The, the two examples, also the, the, the last example you gave, it's also about the power of analogy when it comes to sparking innovation and helping us achieve certain results and driving outcomes. And, and I found it really fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> and also, John, analogies are very effective when it comes to writing speeches, which is also your or one of your areas of expertise. Just out of curiosity, now, again, it can be a very broad question maybe, but I need to ask it. So you've worked as a presidential speech writer for Bill Clinton. Now, apart from politics, I'm not interested in that, but working as a speech writer as part of that team for the president of the United States, what, what does that look like? Again, broad question, uh -huh. what comes to mind? So I loved, I loved it. Uh, it, was a, it was a great uh, experience. I've worked for a lot of different uh, speakers for, uh, for various durations, either at, on staff or you know, short term or individual projects. And there are, I would say that speakers generally fall into two categories. One is uh, are people who are very serious about policy and, and consider the, the speech itself to be frosting on the cake, which is an incorrect uh, assumption. The really speeches start with the baking of the cake. The idea is in them. Uh, and then there are, are people who uh, care mostly about, you know, how does the speech sound? And are, are you guys figure out the, the content uh, and the details. And, and, and President Clinton was somebody who cared about both. Uh, he, he cared deeply about policy and the effectiveness uh, of the policy that he was trying to communicate the ideas. And he cared that it be done um, be as beautifully and, uh, and effectively as possible. And that doesn't necessarily mean fancy language, uh, but uh, he would often use real life examples of a single person and tell a story and then draw the analogy between that and the, and the, the larger policy issue. 
and saying there are, you know, three million people just like Bill Smith, you know, facing this problem every day. And here's what we're going to do about it. And and it was really fun to work with someone who was uh, super smart, super committed, and 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 really took the 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 opportunity to use his pulpit uh, as effectively as possible. And because you say that based on your experience, there are these two types of speakers, again, just out of curiosity, what, what do you think from a communication perspective, what do you think about Barack Obama? Oh, he was great. Um, I loved listening to him speak. He, he, he had some much, uh, uh, he tended to speak in, in, in greater uh, poetic abstraction, uh, which I love because I love poetry and I and I and I, and I, I love the concepts uh, and I and and I agreed with him uh, most of the time uh, and so it was a joy to listen to him speak uh, right. and I knew I know many of his speechwriters and and they were good uh, and so uh, it, it was every president has a has a different style um, I, I would just. Uh, say that I, I don't think uh, tweeting is an effective uh, way to leave a rhetorical record yeah. uh, for posterity. Yeah, and again, another curiosity, like how many, the presidents of the United States, how many speech writers does he or she and in the future have? Are we talking about one speech writer or a team or how, how does it work? Well, both in the Obama and Clinton White House, I think, I mean, when we were there, there were six. Six. Uh, but six or five, six, seven, I think it depends. I'm not sure what the, what the Trump White House had. He, he um, because I wasn't, I wasn't close with, uh, in fact, I did not know his speech writers. So I, I, I don't know uh, at that level, but, but usually uh, about a half dozen, because if you think about it, the president speaks often and, and you don't even see all the times that they speak because they're aimed at a certain audience. And so that you always have to be leapfrogging each other to stay ahead of the president and have remarks that are well-researched, fact-checked, prepared, polished, reviewed, and signed off. Uh, and, and he might need those every day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there is the day that the president doesn't say something, although there are certainly uh, and, and some things are short and don't take that long. So it might be a brief remarks or, or there might be a major speech. And obviously the, the bigger the speech, the more people weigh in on things. Yeah, yeah. And, and John. I'll, I'll, here, I'll tell you one, one thing about this because th there obviously are, are many people who weigh in on speeches uh, at the White House because it is, these are, that's important. You know, it's an important platform and, and, and you don't want errors, certainly, and you don't want the wrong policies pushed or, the, or you don't want to offend people. And you need to be careful about what comes out of the president's uh, mouth. And I always say that the, the, the good speech is like a thoroughbred and, and it's, it's a, the speechwriter's job to make sure it doesn't become a pack mule. Uh, and because everyone wants to hang their line or their idea or their policy or their edit and, and you have to know whose who's saddlebags you can just cut off and <laughs> keep going and whose you have to take along for the, for the ride. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and where, where do you start? So President Bill Clinton comes to you, John, we've got these speech tomorrow, we need to be prepared and maybe it doesn't happen like that, I guess, but like, it's, it could be the president of the United States, it could be any other client. You need to write a speech. What's the very first thing you normally do when you need to write a speech for somebody else? Well, the presidential situation is a little bit different, but, I, but what I, uh, the way I like to approach it is, I, first of all, I like to know when, when they have to give the speech. For me, that's the most important thing to start out with. Okay, you know, when are you speaking? Who are you speaking to? Who is in the audience? What do they care about? What are they concerned about? What are they interested in? And, and you're really trying to come up with uh, that, that base of, of who the audience is. And then, of course, the speaker has their ideas uh, and credibility. You know, what are they, uh, what can they speak about credibly? What are they interested in communication? What is the one idea? I often ask this, if, if you have, if people leave 
this talk and what is the one idea that you want them to remember? And that's often a difficult question for people to answer because they, they might not have taken the time to think about that or they might not have priority, prioritized or they, they might resist boiling it down that much. Uh, but that's important to know what, 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 what's the takeaway? And, and then that can take a lot of different forms. It could be motivation to take action. It could be um, inspiration. It, it could be to inform. It could be to change their mind. It, but, but really thinking through what do we want to accomplish can, can shape uh, what, like I've done big arena speeches, you know, big political arena speeches, and they're really fun because because you you have a crowd to 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 work with, and 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 that's going to give you some options uh, in terms of audience engagement that is very different than uh, a talk to twenty people uh, or at a at a long table. And so, trying to get a hold of your audience, get a hold of what you want to say and what you have credibility to say. What's the argument you want to make, and then also. Um, What's the context uh, of the, not just the speech itself, but, but what moment are we in? Because I think that a lot of people lose sight of the fact that their audience is going to be listening to the news, they're gonna be watching shows, they're gonna be listening to podcasts. And there's a lot, a lot of uh, information competing for their attention and, and how does your, talk or presentation fit into that context uh, with integrity. And it doesn't mean that you can't give a lighthearted speech in a, in a serious time. Uh, goodness knows we could all use more laughter these days, uh, but, but is laughter the, 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 the right thing for this moment uh, for your given speech? Uh, and so I, I like to get people to kind of let go of the idea of the speech and just think about what they want to say. Um, yeah. The idea, what is the idea that you're trying to get across and how can we come up with some stories that help communicate that? The amplify, yeah. And exactly, we follow exactly the same approach. For example, when we work with our clients, we, so you mentioned audience, of course, your objective, the context. We always start with what we call the ABC of preparation. That's always the first thing we do, ABC, audience, burning needs context so we need to ask ourselves it's either us or the, together with the clients who is the audience who are they and and then what are their burning needs what do they really need what do they expect from your talk from your presentation and then exactly as you said what about the context and that's always the first thing and also john when you write from your based on your experience when you write the speech for for somebody else how do you go about writing something that works for that particular person in terms of his or her uh, like personal voice or style? What, what's your take on this? Well, I like stories. So I like to, to hear stories um, from that person. Uh, and sometimes they... Uh, might not recognize the value of their own stories because it's it's the, I mean, if you think about children's books, there's the story and then there's the moral of the story is uh, don't cry wolf or the moral of the story is, uh, it could be anything. Uh, and, and those morals of the story are, are analogies. Uh, you're making an analogy between a, a story, a specific story and a, and a larger situation. So I like to, draw out the stories of um, my clients. And I have one uh, client in particular that comes to mind that's, who's become a good friend of mine. Uh, he's a top heart surgeon. And, and he brought me in initially to do a, a, a big speech. Uh, and, and I talked to him for hours and hours. And, and he, he ended up telling me about the, the, how he was uh, his father had died when he was two years old and, and his mother you know, just struggled to, to put food on the table, but they, but held the, the family together and the role that his grandfather had played 
uh, in his upbringing and teaching him discipline. And, and, and he mentioned that his uh, grandfather was, was not of, of little means, but he was frugal and how he uh, always wore a suit, but he, he used paper clips as cufflinks. And as soon as he said that he used paper clips as cufflinks, I thought, oh, that's gold. And, and indeed we worked that in because cause, cause suddenly you, you're telling the story of this grandfather and the role that they, the, the impression that they made on you as a child. And, and he goes through this description and, 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 and the last thing he mentioned was, and he used paper clips for cufflinks. And suddenly people have an image uh, of this, of the Colonel, as he was called, uh, and, and, and just, the, just the, the fact that he wore cup lengths and he used paper clips said a tremendous about amount. So I'm looking for those details uh, and those stories that can, can take something from the abstract and, and make it very vivid and specific. And then you've got people's attention and you can talk about other, other yeah. things that you need yeah. to talk about, but you need to get people's attention. Yeah, to, to bring your messages to life. And is there anything, yes? It can be small like that too, because it doesn't have to be some great truth, but it has to, it can be a, a small revealing truth. Um, but there has to be some integrity to it. There has to be, there has to be tr some truth at its core and you have to respect, I think, respect your listener by not wasting their time. Uh, and, and I think that one of the biggest pitfalls that, speakers fall into is that they waste people's time either because they think that they have to speak for a long time to be important or they they or they don't take the time to, to write a short speech because it's much harder to write a short one than it is to go on and on absolutely and also they think what what we find john with our clients is that a, a lot of people lots of presenters Often because we know so much about our subject, sometimes we are also emotionally attached to it that we think that everything is important, right? Everything, and, everything get it all in there. That's not, we don't need a freight train. We, we, we need a bullet train. Exactly. If everything is important, then for the audience, nothing is important. Yeah. It's interesting because I give the... Uh, I, I asked people to remember the, the Gettysburg Address, which was Lincoln's greatest speech, apart from his second inaugural, perhaps, but probably his greatest speech. And I forget who the general was that spoke at Gettysburg immediately prior to, to Lincoln taking the stage, but he spoke for, I think, two hours, maybe? And, and I can't even remember his name. I certainly don't know what he said, but of course, Lincoln... He, he had 17 lines and he, he stood up, he made a very succinct and poetic point and he sat down and, and that has stood the test of time. So it's not about length, it's about the, the, the value of the ideas that you're trying to communicate. Yeah. And John, you talked about stories and analogies. Anything, anything else? Any other key elements that make... A, a good speech great that can turn a, an average or a good speech into an unforgettable one maybe there are no other other elements but if, if there is anything anything else you'd like to mention i want to re-emphasize one thing and then i'll add another and, and that is my peanut butter uh sandwich analogy and i think we talked about this previously uh that that when you go to make a sandwich and and you get to the jar and there's not quite enough uh, of, of your chosen condiment there and you try and spread it over the bread and you're trying to get it to the edges and this doesn't go, but you make the sandwich, then the sandwich turns out to be dry. But if there's only this much condiment, a little bit of condiment and you cut the bread in quarters and you, and you make a small sandwich, that's perfect. And so don't spread too little idea over too much time. Uh, and it's okay to have a short speech. No one ever complained uh, that it's... Uh, you know, to, a speech was, was too short. And if, if, if they did, then you're, you're lucky because that means they want more of you and you should rather, you should leave the stage with them. Sorry that you're leaving rather than relieved that you're, you're finally done. Um, uh, and the, the, the second thing I would say is, um, and, I, and I mentioned this before, is, is that kind of coming at it from a point of respecting your audience, respecting their time, respecting who they are, even if you disagree with them, uh, 
and I, I, I've been, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and, and I've really been talking about the, the idea of respect with them. And, and it's not just about obedience, which is something different. That's one, one aspect of, of respect. Um, but it's about respecting the nature and, and, re, and respecting the people around you and, 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 res, and, and approaching um, life from a, uh, a, a place of awe and a place of wonder and a place of enthusiasm and a place of humility. And that doesn't mean that you don't come at things with healthy ego. And obviously I'm, I'm not explaining it in, in, in these exact terms to my two-year-old and four-year-old, but these are the, these, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lead them is that we need to show respect. Um, and this world would be a lot better off if we showed respect more, to, 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 especially to, to people that we disagree with. And, and there's this, this kind of, we live in this age of demonization and polarization. Uh, but I think that, that if you approach your speaking engagements uh, from a, a place of, with healthy ego, but a place of humility. And, and it doesn't mean that you pander to people or that you don't challenge people, um, but it's, it, it's, it means that you need to, to kind of honor the intention of, of, of engagement and engagement is, uh, means listening and, and I and I guess this that's the roundabout way to say that I think that the best speech givers are the best listeners uh, and and that doesn't and and so good speeches start with good listening yeah and I love that John and that would have been a perfect conclusion of our conversation if it wasn't for the fact that I do have a few other things <laughs> a few yeah. other questions I, for you but I talk. loved it I, I really loved it. I wanted to ask you now. You you write speeches for for your clients, and but you 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 are also a speaker yourself. So just out of curiosity, are there, do you find any differences between either writing a speech for somebody else versus for you, or giving a speech? So it could be writing, it could be giving a talk. Do you see any differences? Uh well, I, I'll say that giving speeches makes one much more empathetic to the speech giver. Uh, and and uh, I think the largest, I, I've written speeches for, that were delivered before uh, tens of, you know, probably 10,000 people and, and that have gone very well. And, and, and the largest speech I've given is to probably about 1,200, 1,400 people, something like that. I, I forget the exact capacity of the arena. Uh, or the, the auditorium, and and it's much harder to stand up and give a good talk than it is to to write a good talk because a you've got all the, the normal. I mean, the more you do things, the the more comfortable you, you become doing it. And I don't I don't do uh, a lot of big talks. I do you know many more smaller talks, and those are much more conversational. Uh, and I try to. Uh, keep them that way. Uh, but uh, so empathy is one thing uh, that I, I, I've learned. And, and, it, and it's good to be, if you're a speaker, to think about where the audience is coming from. And if you're in the audience, it's, we've all been in, in talks where the, the speaker is not doing so great. And it, it might not be through any fault of their own. It, it, or it might be that they've, listen, we've all written speeches that have not been well delivered, that were perfectly good speeches. But uh, they weren't practiced enough or, or, or the person got nervous and that's okay. Uh, not everybody, listen, Bill Clinton has given bad speeches before. Barack Obama has given speeches that didn't go well. Everybody gives, if you speak enough, uh, you know, only the closed mouth gathers no flies. Um, so uh, you're, not every speech is going to be uh, great because it can't be. Because if every speech were great, then, then what would you inscribe in books and, and stones and, and, and 
posters. I mean, it, it, it's so just... true. So, so true. I was reading a book recently, and it was not about speech writing or public speaking, but they were they were talking about another discipline. I don't I don't even remember what the discipline was, but they were saying, look, the only way to get great at this is to be good at this. First, you need to be good if you want great to be great, mm -hmm. and if you, the only way to get good at something is to try. So if you yeah. want to get great, first you need to be good. And actually what they said, first you need to be good. And then if you want to be good at something, first you need to be bad uh, at that thing. And for you to be bad at it, you need to try. So you always start with just trying. Yeah, and that's true with your, if you're learning to play a musical instrument. Uh, that is true. Uh, if, if you're learning to cook, that is just true. Now people have certain aptitudes and take to certain skills uh, more than others, more easily than others. But yeah, speaking is like anything else. If you practice, you get better. Writing speeches is, is like anything else. If you practice, you get better. And so I think it's just uh, important that we uh, do our best and, and try and learn from each. Uh, I've written speeches that have bombed. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and I can remember specific speeches that bombed and they just didn't go as planned. And, and usually that's because I didn't uh, know enough about the audience. Um, but I, and as I got more experience in my career, I, I, I paid attention. I became a better listener. Yeah, yeah. Are there any speech writers, one or more speech writers that you really admire, John? Well, um, there are. Um, uh, I really like Terry Edmonds, uh, who was Bill Clinton's last chief speechwriter. Uh, and uh, he, he's a friend of mine, but he's very uh, poetic and, and, and approaches uh, speeches from a deep sense of humanity. Uh, he, he always accuses me of, of writing too hot. Uh, you know, because I sometimes you, sometimes you need to write your first draft and and just get it out of the system, and and, and you, maybe you salvage a little bit from it, but you, you get off your you work off your your frustration and your your outrage or your your moral indignation, and this, and then you and you get then you get back to writing the speech. Um, I, I really liked uh, uh, him, uh, and there were a number of. Obama speech writers that were, were very good. But I, I think the important thing is, I mean, we live in this age of, hey, look at me, hey, look at me. Uh, and everyone's trying to, to get the spotlight because, because we live in this age of, of social media. And I think uh, the best speech writers do their work quietly. Uh, and behind the scenes. Yeah. Behind the scenes. And, and I'll tell you one funny story though, because. I, I, I was working at the uh, Democratic Convention uh, a couple, few conventions ago, and, and there was this up and coming governor uh, who had presidential aspirations who came in with his speech and, and they have to work with the boiler room. I was in the boiler room, we've got a dozen speech writers. Every speech just gets, gets reworked and vetted to fit into the larger themes of the convention. And he came in with a terrible speech and, and fought tooth and nail to, to you know, keep it that way, but in the end exceeded you know, over a process of negotiation and editing that was very unpleasant, uh, uh, a final speech. And he gave, and I was the writer on it, uh, and, and he gave the, the speech which you know, brought the entire arena to, the, to its feet. They were cheering. I mean, it really was a, it was a great speech. And then he, he told the, uh, the press uh, afterward, yeah, they gave me a terrible speech, and I just had to wing it. <laughs> and 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 I, uh, I I told the reporter afterward. I said, I know he wants to run for president, uh, and I and I think you should know the real story, um, uh, just so you know his character, because that is character. It it would have been one thing to say, oh, I, I love that speech. It went well. Thank you to the reporter, or uh, I worked really hard on that speech, or, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't start out there, but that's, you know, we really worked on that. There were any number of things that had to do with zero mention of the speech. I wasn't looking for accolades. 
but to throw the speechwriter under the bus who saved him from doing a, a, ter a, a terrible speech uh, is really not cool. Yeah. Not cool. The character, yeah. No, I, I, absolutely. And John, as we approach the conclusion of, it, of this lovely conversation, from, from my side at least, yeah, I hope yeah, you enjoyed it. With you. <laughs> Uh, there, there's one question that I always, I always ask uh, our guests because I, I love reading. So now you are the right, you wrote four books, right? So yes. I read Shortcut, but you've got three others um, beyond also what you, what you wrote. And by the way, let, let me just mention it again for our listeners. If you are interested in what we've discussed today with John, highly recommend it here, Shortcut. How Analogies Reveal Connections, Spark Innovation, and Sell Our Greatest Ideas. Fantastic book. Now, John, for you, if you think about what we've discussed today, either analogies or speech writing, communication in general, is there, and if, if nothing comes to mind, that's totally fine. But if it does, if there, is there one book that, that really stood out for you that you would recommend? Uh, 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 all books or, or, or my books? Uh, not no, no your books, but in general, maybe other people's books. In terms of speech writing? It could be either speech writing or it could be analogies. It could be communication in general. It could be anything which is connected to what we talked about today. Okay, so so what I would say is that I, I when I first got into speech writing and I hadn't written any speeches, I bought a book on speech writing and, and I, I have a... a a, a shelf of books, uh, and usually there's you get one or two good ideas from them. But I would say that the the if you want to become a better speech writer or a better speech giver, even more importantly, it, it's just to read widely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, read history, read culture, read fiction, read just read, 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 because that's the raw material that you have to work with and you never know when it's going to come into play uh, and, and when that will be useful, when that anecdote, when that line, when that reference uh, will be the perfect um, mortar between the bricks of your speech or, or maybe the bricks themselves. Uh, and, and so it's just to consume more broadly uh, along the way, uh, rather than any given uh, speech. But I, 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 if you're gonna read a speech writing book, I think that um, TED Talks uh, is a good one uh, because it teaches you how to condense uh, a speech down to 12 minutes, if you need it to be 12 minutes. And there are, there are, most, there, there are very few speeches that are 25 minute speeches it wouldn't be a lot better at 12 minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Where, where, you, where are you referring to TED Talks by Chris Anderson or yeah, maybe to yeah, yeah, that yeah, one, yeah. That one. Yeah, liked it. Yeah, I like that book. Yeah, yeah okay. It was, helpful. it was helpful. Yeah, thank you. And, and is there anything else, any final message that you'd like to share with the listeners or maybe is there anything that you, you wish I'd ask you, but I forgot to do? Any, any final message for audience today? I would say um, that everybody has worthwhile stories to tell, that stories can be the backbone of uh, just about any speech, uh, and, and that the capacity to be vulnerable uh, or to express your humanity uh, is much more compelling than the bravado and, and, and polish that, that many people feel they have to uh, project, that there is strength and humility uh, and your audience will relate to you um, more deeply uh, if you're not trying to impress, but you're trying to uh, communicate uh, from a deeper place. Thank you. Thank you, John. I really respect your, your message, the way you deliver it, what's behind it. And thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. I really enjoy uh, 
speaking with you and hope we get to do so again. Yeah, and we keep in touch. All the best, John. All right, thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of the Ideas on Stage podcast, there are many more you might like. So please subscribe, leave us a review, and tell us what you think. You can find many more ideas on business communication at ideasonstage.com or by searching for Ideas on Stage on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and goodbye for now.